Alrighty, welcome back to the Smokescreen Podcast, episode nine. <laughs> Number nine. And we got a doozy today. <laughs> we got we got a doozy. One is pretty pretty it's hot y'all's right fault. now. It is. It really is. Uh, because we got a question. So let me say this really quickly. We had asked last week when we did the the James Randy stuff, right? We said, you know, leave us some questions and you know ask us anything, and we'll do a podcast on it. So. The problem is we said that at the end of the podcast when people had probably tuned out, so we only got a few. But it was Matt, yep. I believe Matt Chaplin. I can't re- I can't. Matt Chapin. Matt, Matt Chapin. Chapin. I'm sorry, yep. Matt. Matt Chapin had asked us, have you guys watched this new documentary on Bob Lazar? So we're going to use that, Matt. <laughs> so thank you for the yeah. question. And we're going to actually just talk about that because we, in fact, did watch this documentary the other night. So me and James have both been down this rabbit hole of Bob Lazar. And for those not familiar, he is apparently the guy who broke the Area 51 story back in, what, 1984? No, 89. 89, yep. 89. okay. So, yeah, this is uh, this goes down a lot of rabbit holes. So we won't be able to cover every little thing in detail, but... Yeah, he, I, I guess. Yeah, go ahead with the general. I was just gonna say he recently, story. you know, resurfaced um, old Joe Rogan for me. Yes, uh, uh, Joe Rogan's podcast had the Phil Banker and Bob Lazar there, and he he led into it on the episode the day before. He had some guests on there, and he was say, or I think he had a uh, sway or no Charlemagne the God. Yeah, Charlemagne. Yeah, yep, yep. and uh, said. They were going to go out to eat that night before right. with Bob Lazar. And uh, so he was talking about that and getting amped up about it. The next day, he has Bob and the filmmaker. His name is. Let me get my notes here. Yeah, yeah this, take is, notes on this, this one, is one we have uh, a lot of names and just little, not notes, but mainly names and stuff because there's so many people. And we won't have them all, I'm sure. Yeah. But and we is... know that people care about this, and they they're going to know names and stuff. So you know, we tried to you know jot down a few notes about that, so we right. wouldn't screw up some names. But it was a uh, Jeremy Corbell, I guess, or Corbell. He made this um, documentary. It's on Netflix. It's called uh, Bob Lazar, Area Fifty One, and Flying Saucers. Right. So. So yeah, let me say really quickly too. This is not necessarily about flying saucers. This is about the the Bob Lazar story specifically. I don't. Uh, that's a whole another podcast. Whether you believe in actual or flying, ten. or ten exactly. And we actually we did that in an old podcast back in the day anyway. Mm-hmm. So I don't. I'm not here to do, to argue aliens versus real or not or whatever. I just think just on sheer numbers alone, just the numbers game. The you know of how many stars are in the galaxies and how many galaxies are in the universe and all that stuff. We're probably not alone. So I'm not disputing that whatsoever. But this story is really, really crazy. It's really insane. Um, it is. It's, it's fascinating. It is fascinating. That's a, and, that's a good um, word. Honestly, you know, you, you guys, um, this one has been uh, – Chris got a little heated. Me and Chris had a little heated discussion earlier getting ready for this thing. <laughs> right. um, so <laughs> we're glad we didn't film that or record that. Um, but yeah, no, no, it's, it's, it's a weird thing. Cause it gets, it, it kind of, you know, it, it pulls at your conspiracy theory strings yes. in a bunch of different ways. Yes. When you start thinking government cover up and things like that. And so, you know, it's, I don't know. It, it, it really is. You dig in, you dig your heels in, and you want to believe something, and then something else will surface. There's a lot out there on this guy, guys. There's I mean, a lot of stuff. And I think it goes back to, I think, the reason we had this conversation was there's, we each have our own biases, our confirmation biases where, James, I think you'll agree, you're more prone to want to believe that type of thing. I'm more of the skeptic, and that's what actually makes us a good team. Exactly. But what I was saying was I think the main point was is you really can't – there's really no way to prove or disprove anything he says once he got into what's called S4. So he he claims not to have worked at Area 51 but near there where they had these nine flying saucers. And there's no way to really prove or disprove anything he says there other than kind of – theoretical stuff and some phys- yeah. some physics stuff as well i guess but, yeah. but what i was saying what is what you were saying just now though I, I found this uh carl sagan quote oh okay it says uh you can't convince a believer of anything for their belief is not based on evidence 
It's based on a deep-seated need to believe. Yes. So uh, there and, you and go. Exactly. That's uh, And that has a true. lot to do with me. I have, I believe certain things, um, you know, so I will bend or shake yeah, right. my, right. you know, intake and output around my beliefs. I do. And, um, and and I'm sure I do a, a little bit of the opposite, but I'm I'm just I just it's just my natural way is to start to question things, and that's just the way I am. But like I was saying, I guess the main point was for that discussion before we we came on was the stuff we can look into is, is are legitimate questions. Where, for example, in the documentary Bob Lazar's people were asking him about his past and his you know education, which is a big a big question. Those are the things you can look into to see if he has credibility. The same you would do in a court of law. If you have a defense lawyer comes up, a witness, is, they, they, that's the first thing they try to do is discredit them based off other things. Now, just because you've lied in the past or you have something on your record doesn't mean that you are not telling the truth now, but it is still a valid question, as I was saying, it's about all yeah. the, you know, the educational stuff. And, well, let's kind of lay out Yeah, I guess we got to generalize the story. Or whatever, yeah. yeah. Um, cause I'm, I mean, I'm not a hundred percent on any of this stuff. Um, so I guess we should kind of lay out what his claims, who, yes. who he is and his claims or whatever, and then maybe, um, start to unravel it from there. If there's a string hanging loose, <laughs> right, right. Um, Pl- plenty of those. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, he basically is a guy who, uh, became known on, by a news station and you know how your local news um you know abc or nbc or cbs affiliate or fox now will they'll do these little uh pieces that that encompass a couple days where yes. it might be on um you know fraud uh by you know fast food restaurants or you know what i mean they'll, <laughs> right. they'll, they'll go in there undercover we're, we're gonna yeah. bust these people not giving us the right well here back. locally had don lemon yeah we had don lemon always going out to bust people yeah so you know these these kind of reporters do their thing and they find these stories they latch on to and they put some stuff together and they'll they'll uh release it over a few days and that's what happened here out in uh las vegas area uh this news station uh the the guy who worked there his name was george knapp k-n-a-p-p and he you know basically broke this bob lazar story which at the time bob lazar didn't reveal his identity yeah the first one he was as dennis yeah he was had a, with the, quotes around it with yeah quotes around it and you couldn't see his face and all that when he broke this story in a van in a news van yeah in a news van so basically he said hey guys i worked at um, a secret facility in Area 51 called S4. And in this facility, like my first day there, I saw flying saucers being stored there. Yeah, the first one he touched. Yeah, he, he touched. had an American got, flag sticker on it. Got reprimanded by the guy. He was like, eyes forward, you know, don't touch things and all right. this stuff. So... The first day he's there, he sees these things, and he goes in, and he's supposed to replace a guy who just left for some reason. Maybe he died, maybe he got fired or decided to leave. Whatever, he replaces a guy, and they work in two-man groups. And he said, he claims that him and his buddy, his partner, were um, they were tasked with reverse engineering a propulsion system for one of these UFOs. Right. That it was all alien technology. Not possible here. Absolutely not possible here. It was a gravity or anti-gravity, however you want to say it. I think he switches between both sometimes. He'll, yeah. say, he'll call it a gravity. The way he describes it, I guess it would be anti-gravity because he says it, it's, it repels. Yeah, it will bring the destination to you yes. instead of you go to it. Basically. He says the feeling is like going towards a big magnet with another magnet that's repelling you. Yeah. That's the feeling by and getting near it. So... It's, he describes it as like a silver chrome looking dome, stainless steel dome. And if you take the top, half dome, I mean, and if you take the top off of it, it inside of it, it takes a little wedge or kind of like an arrowhead, wouldn't you say? It looks like an arrowhead. Basically, this is the element 115 we'll get into. But yeah, yeah it takes element 115 is what they told him it was called, um, or what, what they said it was, was element 115. And 
if you get the right little triangular wedge of this and you insert it into this little tube or whatever that it sits in, put the dome back on, it works. It cuts on. Yeah. Then there's and no switches. Like he said, you could push your hand with no metal on your hand or in your hand towards it, and it's like opposite ends of a magnet right. pushing away from each other. It felt like that. So anyway, his claims were that – not only had he worked on that, oh, and there's no wires or anything in this thing. Uh, everything just fits together. There, you can't see how they're connected, how they work together or anything. But he's also been in a, a, a UFO, right? He's been in a yeah. flying saucer. He said on one occasion he got to go in to see how the components were laid out because, again, you said no wires. Right. And they're in some configuration, but they're not like, I don't know if it's all stacked or together, but basically described and he described in different ways throughout the years, but basically the same story where one time he got to go in into the main level, as he calls it, because he said there's three there's levels, three levels. To this the thing. main level is the, um, I guess cockpit area, but it's all like smooth, seamless, rounded edges. No, no right angles. Looks like it's uh, either ceramic or metal. He said he, he can't tell um, no heat, anything like that. So he's not sure. But then above that, he believes is 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 like um is is kind of like the standard saucer shape with windows, but not really windows. He he figures there's some kind of sensor arrays, yeah, and some kind of version of a computer. But he got to go in the main, and then there's one hatch, some honeycomb type hatch that goes to the below the the lower chamber where the actual anti gravity machines yeah, the are the three of them or whatever yeah. it is not they don't thrust that's right i yeah, can't call them that right the propulsion systems yeah so there's the the amplifiers are on the main level and then through the floor i'm assuming he's saying that the you see the things at the bottom the Didn't three he say different he was things. like hanging upside down said he was hanging upside yeah. down so small yeah and 16 I, that's inches. another thing it's small the seats were small and where chris said was like the cockpit yes it was like miniature chairs and stuff in there to sit in but no panels but no panels no it's controls like, no buttons i guess would lay your palm on this thing and it would read your intentions <laughs> I don't, I'm or not, just i'm not sure yeah we don't he didn't he didn't ever said any detail about how one would control it um the but other, it has been controlled it has been controlled exactly because he said he witnessed a test flight one exactly. time exactly where they brought him outside and it was hovering off the ground a couple feet uh, he goes from anywhere from three to five to ten sometimes, but then it went a little bit left and, and a little bit right, and then came back down and sat down normally. But at the same time, he said they were in communication with whoever was inside piloting the thing yeah. with regular radios, which, which would be impossible. Like that would, right. He says himself would be impossible with these gravity machines because we know ours our communication takes waves you know yeah and, and it's, gravity it's, it distorts distort all that it distorts everything yeah. so yeah so that that's basically the thing he, he he came out and basically was saying hey guys i'm just a whistleblower here right i'm just telling you what's going on i think the world needs to know this stuff i think it's a crime that the government's not telling you this is the biggest thing of mankind yeah there are aliens that we have their technology and they're hiding it from you, that type of thing. So that's where, that's the basic story. And well, I guess I did leave out the part that, and, and I guess one would assume by hearing that he worked somewhere like that, he claimed to be a physicist. Yes. Yes. And that brings up a lot of the arguments down the road uh, because, you know, when you introduce yourself as a, Hey, I'm a physicist. I worked here at the secret place, reverse engineering this alien, you know, craft, and uh, propulsion system, um, you know what I mean? Then all of a sudden, here's the part, you know, where it's kind of, people want to ask more questions, basically. You can't yeah. just tell your story and then walk away. Right, that's you know right. I mean? And I think he almost expected that a little bit or something. It's the, way I, the feeling I get. Must have. Because at some point he gave a Q&A, a live Q&A, after coming out and, uh, and stuff, and then people started saying, "Okay, so where did you go to school, and where did you work before, and how did you get hired, and how did all this process work?" So he came up with these answers. He had answers for some kind of answers, but not really. So that's what I was saying to James earlier. Was a lot of times he's really vague, and this is really what I, I know, but I don't know any more than this. And other times he gets pretty detailed. Um, 
I guess it's like he picks his audience. I would assume. Yeah, I'll, I, if he exactly. thinks you know your stuff, he's going to be vague. If he thinks you don't, he will probably try to talk tech jargon. It, it's the way it seems exactly. So the first big point of contention was the education. I yeah. guess let's start with the education. So he claims to have um, went to. First of all, some local community college in, was a California, well, right? The thing about that, I don't think he brought that up until somebody brought it to him. That is true. I think he basically said, I got a, a, a master's from MIT and it, from yes. Caltech. It, it, it's changed. This went from master's at MIT and a master's at Caltech to a master's at MIT and only a bachelor's from Caltech. So there's been a couple of different versions. But he's definitely went to school both places, according he's to him. He's definitely, right. He's definitely got degrees from both places. And, you know, and so people, the, it started with this news reporter, Knapp, started looking into this because he says he didn't believe him. Well, then he, he can't find any records. He can't find where he attended. He can't find anybody who remembers him. Um, he can't, can't find his, find his master master's thesis. thesis. He doesn't have a degree on the wall anywhere. Right. And then in this open Q and A, which anybody you can find on YouTube easily, uh, his old interview back in what, 89, 92. I don't know exactly. It's an old VHS looking video, but, uh, he says, okay, can you tell somebody asked him, can you give me a couple of professors? And he got, he's like, sure, I can give you a couple. I mean, I don't have a list of them or anything. And he names off these two names. And then the guy says, Okay, what year did you get your master's in MIT? And he, and he couldn't remember the year. He said, I think it would have been 82. 82 after yeah. thinking, after like literally pausing. <clears throat> and it's like, okay, first off, that was the big I thing. Would Wait, say, would yeah. you not remember when you got your master's from MIT? Yeah. I mean, that's a big deal, guys. It, it is a big it, deal. I mean, MIT, everybody knows MIT. Yes. You know? And it's like you mentioned earlier, you can't remember all your teachers. I can't remember all my teachers, but I damn sure know what year I graduated. Yes. yes. So, and. So, yeah, th this is kind of a little bit where I think Chris and I start to uh, go uh, different directions with this because, like Chris said in the beginning, you know, I believe just like he does because of, based on sheer number of planets and galaxies and other stuff that uh, yeah, yeah. we're not alone. So we're, we're, we're in the same boat here. And exactly. we both pretty much um, agree that something awfully top secret is – happening in area 51 <laughs> you know they yeah, have armed no guards doubt. and stuff out there no right we, we agree with that um we both agree that his education is shady where we start disagreeing is i kind of buy his answer here's where you know chris don't buy his answer i kind of buy his answer that well the government won't, don't want me to tell this so they're Make him, they're erasing me. They're erasing me. Right. My, so my th records. that was kind of the thing. So, yeah, the just thing. Want to throw that out there. Yeah, the answer to, to all this, you know, heat that came down on him and still, I guess, still is, and certainly now with this documentary, is that, you know, he can't really answer these questions about, you know, his education uh, or his work history. And we'll get into that too. About but, his education, did you say that uh, some research you did showed that timelines showed that it would have been impossible? Yes, he was like because he, was he has other public else. records that were never erased. Right, uh, where he filed bankruptcy, he got in trouble a couple of times. He's been to court uh, one time, so, and, and again, this is not to this is not to paint him as, as some kind of you know fraud. Now it's just out there in the public. Uh, he got involved with uh, some hooker ring in a brothel. Yep, uh, was in court for that, um, and then he filed bankruptcy, which was not in the documentary. And there is where you start to get some discrepancies about his work history. So mm -hmm. back to the really quick though, back to the teachers thing, the two main the people he named did ended up being real teachers. Right. But the problem is one of them was a high school teacher where he did go to school. Where he did go to school, and the other was a community college teacher where he took one class at Pierce uh, Community College. Pierce Community Pierce College, Junior College, or whatever they call it. Right. It na names change. On so there's no those. doubt he did some electrical stuff, and that's when he basically said, "Yes, I did go to Pierce for a little bit." Yes. So you know? it was first. It was just those and, two, uh, and then before that, once they figured that out, yes, I did before I went to MIT or whichever first. So granted. Granted, um, I agree that that is all weird, and um, that has you know nothing to do with the government hiding his stuff. I mean, he's the one fumbling on these answers, right? Yes. Um, and when Chris and I first watched it, 
um, you know, we actually were talking that night about, well, couldn't he show him the degree that should be hanging on his wall? Okay, the government's not going to, you know, you can't. Yeah, when, we, no when we got done watching that, that uh, disappear. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt, but when uh-huh. we got done watching that, remember, we went outside and I said, there's something, I mean, because I, I wanted to believe the dude. It, he seems like a very cool guy, a normal guy, whatever. Yeah, he but does I was like, seem something's real not, normal. Something's not sitting right with me about the vagueness and, like, why wouldn't somebody just ask him to describe the hallways of MIT? Yeah, that's where I was going. And yeah, all that stuff. Cause, yeah, yeah when, when we started with the, where's the, you know, degree supposed to be hanging on the wall. And then, then Chris was like, well, that would be easy. Has anybody uh, ever asked him, you know, what well, what was your day like? You know, did you commute uh, on foot, on a bike? Where did you go? What hall did you go in? Or uh, You know what I mean? And yeah, it's I mean, like you could describe that. If you went to a school, like I told Chris, I, you know, went to school um uh, I went to Catawba College here locally, and I think I started around 2003. Um, I was going at night. Um, I can only name, like, one professor off the top of my head that I had there. You know, I went there for four years, and, uh, you know, I took him. I had multiple classes with him, and he and I um, had similar interests and would talk after school, um, you know, after class about sports and things like that. And so, uh, of course, his name pops up first. And if I was pressed, I could probably sit down and maybe name one or maybe two more. So I give him, I'll give him a little leeway on naming people. But if I was asked, I would not name a high school teacher. It, exactly. You know, and and I'm the same way. I, I went to I EC, wouldn't do that. Yeah, I went to ECU two years, and I couldn't tell you a single professor. And and that's and that's just the way it is. But I can tell you almost every high school teacher. You could describe the campus. I could describe everything about and, the campus, yeah. the dorm I stayed in, and then the apartment I lived in the second year. Yeah. I could describe the gym, the cafeteria. And None if this somebody pressed been, you, you would offer that without even being asked. Honestly, you'd be like, I would absolutely. Yeah, I think anybody normal would. Right. So I do. Like I told Chris, that's my biggest want want moment with him is that one interview where he stutters. And all that. Now, so so the person in me who, who wants to be on his side, how can I justify that? That's tough. That's a real tough one. Was he under a lot of stress? And that's the thing. On the Joe Rogan podcast, he, he used this thing where he said he had migraine. At the beginning. That's convenient. That, it, that's convenient to use that to act like, well, I'm getting nervous, or I'm, and it causes me to have a migraine and a, a, anxiety, you know, an anxiety and migraines. and all that stuff, you know. So, but by that's the time at, at the time, by the time they got to kind of the middle end, then he was really comfortable. Joe wasn't pressing him hard on anything. Then he got really seemed to comfortable, and they didn't even bring up the migraine thing again till the end. So I guess it went away. So it was, it was re- that's what I was telling you. It was really odd because it was really short, vague answers. And then as they got more comfortable, they started discussing some other things. But Joe, and that's a lot of the and comments he had I read. Guy, the, the filmmaker was there, and he bailed him out a lot of times. He did when and Joe would start pressing. That was the weird part: is the filmmakers always got to be with him. Yeah, and and all these other interviews I've seen since then, and and then a lot of comments in Joe Rogan's podcast was that you didn't ask him a single question to verify anything. You didn't press him hard enough, and so I think that's true. And then he kind of got comfortable and forgot about the migraine. Right. So then it was more about just in general life out there. You know, being a whistleblower, you're a hero type thing. You know what I mean? As opposed to details. So, since we've watched it, and we've both started trying to go down the rabbit hole, you know, Chris and I communicate via text um, about different things. He'll send me links and stuff. And, and you know, I, I told him, it's like, okay, I don't think, and it's just me personally, that his whole story and everything about what he says is like a house of cards that if you remove the education piece the education card that the whole thing collapses but there are other things that since we've looked into it more there are more than just the education piece that do seem a little weird and i mean i still want to believe and and you know do you want to cover some more of the discrepancy type things yeah, because sure. I think and, I laid out basically, and, and his I agree, claims, right? Yeah, agree? I, I think so. I think that's the general claims that's, and but this is what makes people dig because they are so vague and it's such a short story. If you think about it, when we first started watching this thing, I was like, okay, it's a short story about here's what he did, whatever. But then when you start thinking and start seeing some of the 
rebuttals to it, then you're like, oh, okay, now I see this goes a lot deeper. So, but to me, though, the education thing, it's not just about whether he got names right or wrong or whatever, don't remember the year, you can't find his thesis and all this stuff for a master's degree at MIT. It's that if you don't have the education, you don't get jobs as a physicist. Right. You know, so that's a big thing. And, and I know that, honestly, realistically, like you said, in a court of law, if you prove somebody's a liar, yes, then everything out of their mouth after that, once you prove it right. to the jury, everything out of their mouth after that is under scrutiny. It, it, right. Right? It, it should be. It should be. It should be. I get that. I do. Right. So the other part, I guess the other biggest thing, so people started, and this is all started by George Knapp, the reporter, because he was tr- apparently trying to um, basically discredit him is what he says. Now, I'm not sure about his actual motives or whatever. Um, Because he was a UFO guy. Can I stop you? I know you ain't going to forget that point. No. So let me just throw this in there. (laughs) We both hated George Knapp on that documentary. Yes. Because he chose this giant pool room to to with horrible acoustics when he, when he when it first came on the night before when me and uh, Ho had started watching for fifteen minutes before he had to he took off so we man you watched it the next night I was like really you're a sound guy on the news and you're gonna pick a pool room. With and, an echo, and the filmmaker's gonna let it happen, and you're gonna, yeah, the filmmaker's like, yeah, let's go in here with all this reverb. And if you guys watch it, you'll see exactly it happens right away. You're uh, like immediately. Hopefully, he moves out of this room. No, he doesn't. It was like, are you showing off your money? I'm not sure what's going on here. Yeah, me either. So um, go ahead. Sorry, yeah, I no, had to say that. no, I, I, that needs to be stated because <laughs> it's just <laughs> ridiculous. But it, um, the other thing, other than edu- education, was. His work history. So people started asking, okay, well, how did it lead up to you getting, how does one get into Area 51 or S4, whichever, one of these secret locations in, in Nevada? And it started with, um, it started with Los Alamos National Laboratory. So he was featured on the front page of the same newspaper locally, right, as a physicist working at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And there was a discrepancy between That's what it says under the picture. It does. It it says it in the article on the front page of the paper because he got attention in town for driving a rocket car to work. So there's no doubt the dude was a tinker, liked electronics and whatever, but it goes back to even when he was a kid, he had bikes with rocket things on it, right, little rocket engines, mini engines. And he drove this damn car, apparently. It was... You could hear it a mile away to to work every day. Right. So at the time, he was a photo lab technician, his, his own personal business. He developed photographs, essentially, uh, for, for companies, a small business. And he apparently got hired at Los Alamos through a contractor called EG&G as a physicist. And now when you start digging into some of that, you see that there's a guy that comes out who is a co-worker of his, and he, well, let me back up a little bit. So people started questioning, okay, was he there? Is there proof that he actually worked there? So then the phone book came out, the phone directory of this company. And it came out, and he, in fact, was listed in there, and it shows his name on every little pro-Bob documentary. Yeah, and I questioned Chris on this earlier. Yeah. So what you don't see, though, is another. I said, what did I say? I said, why would a single lab have a phone book? Phone book, <laughs> right. and then he did some research and he found a yeah. And and I remember I was going to say because because I said it don't, it don't mean it's one building, right? And uh, because I remember having directories at Old Bank of America, but it's days. not just multiple buildings. It's a giant campus. It's a giant campus. Yeah, it's a giant. It's a, not a secret place. This is not the same place. I think that was a big discrepancy too that makes a big difference. Is this is not the Area Fifty One S Four place. This is a separate. National Laboratory All that, that works. proves is he was in town. Yes. Um, so he was there in the directory, but the directory was of all employees and contractors. Yep. So his name should have been in there. So you right. you go into some of these videos and, and articles that you dig down in about the history of this, and he did work with this guy who's on camera saying that he and him were both electrical technicians, and they built these little, like 300 of these little – I guess some radiation, kind of scanner. radiation scanners and that's what he did there. But he just told the paper he was a physicist. So therefore they just put it in this little, well, here, the little here's title. also the thing. Cause I don't think I'm alone here. I, I, I think, and when you watch this documentary guys, if you haven't already, you are led to fall for the phone book thing. Yes, you're absolutely. 
They, they. I mean, it makes you think it's on Area Fifty One. Yes, it, it it really does. Yeah, it, 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 yeah. When you when I thought back about it when we were talking outside, I was thinking, yeah, it is a little blurry. But then it, I, I went and pulled it Los makes Alamos you think up completely that it's, separate. Uh, uh, like a uh, basically that whole uh, area uh, phone book, and it's not. So it makes you it's think not. that it's proof that he did actually work there in some Old capacity. Area 51, On area fifty one, area fifty one S four, and it's off site. It's like. It's a good ways away, basically. Yeah, it's uh, it's a completely different thing, which is what supposedly led him to work at Area Fifty One or S Four. Yeah, you we literally should... think that it's everybody with top secret clearance and these badges, and they have to do the hand scan, are in that phone book, right? And, and it's that's not. not the case. It's a completely separate location. So, anyway, this guy comes on camera. You you know, we'll we'll, we'll try to put the appropriate some uh, some links in YouTube description if you're listening to this on YouTube. That's a good idea. Uh, just uh, just to give you, I mean, not every one of them, obviously. We've been down so many, but it give you a good head start if you're interested in digging down and the, you know joining us in the rabbit hole. Yeah, we don't pretend to know your education levels. Some of you guys can look at some of this stuff. He's going to put links to and go, oh wow, because it gets deep. It, I mean, it gets yeah, it gets scientific way deep stuff because you have yeah you have uh, physicists who've been asked to because like I said before, in some like the Joe Rogan podcast, it's really vague. But in other past uh, interviews with he, throughout, throughout the years, God, this has been you know thirty years now, or close to it. He has been specific in some things, and like you said, I think it's based on who he's talking to. So physicists have actually looked at some of his his actual statements and basically blew him out of the water, saying he's not. He don't know what he's talking about. He's not a physicist. It's not. This is not right. It's wrong. If you know anything about physics, you know this can't work. Blah 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 blah. And I came out of that documentary saying he didn't really speak like a, or when we watched in Joe Rogan too, he didn't really speak like a scientist. He was never laying down any kind of technical terms besides just general knowledge. Right. And and that's what kind of uh, brought me in was like, this is just a normal good guy, you know? He, right. Because he didn't seem too um, techy and using all that jargon and stuff. But um, this might be a good time to uh drop that website because you know some of the stuff chris is talking about the guy actually will start out by saying hey this sounds like he's talking about this and that kind of makes sense but here's the technical part of it and right. he breaks it down like a scientist would yeah and has scientists and join you, him and, and all kinds of things yeah. so the the website is alien com. And I don't know this guy's name. We tried to find his name, but he's got a YouTube channel as well. It's the same thing, Alien Scientist. So that's AlienScientist.com. That's just one of many websites and YouTube channels and whatever articles who have been written about this guy. Um, so anyway, that's a good starting point if you want to check out some of the kind of the, I guess, busted videos or debunked videos to get the other side of the story. And it goes into detail about so many different things. Uh, like, for example... Uh, one detail uh, that was a pretty big deal is he apparently produced a pay stub because people pressed him so much or whatever, and he produced a pay stub which read uh, it was like his contractor pay stub from S four, yeah. and it was um, it it was the Department of Navy Intelligence was the I name. I think you're right. I yeah. believe that. I believe you're yeah, right. I can pull it up and look exactly. I'm pretty but I, sure. I believe that's you're right. right. It's close, guys. It's close yes. to that. So anyway, it was, then you find out, it's pointed out that, um, and, and by the way, this is like a standard kind of a W-2 form, and it's got his name and the, the payee, and yeah, it's got an IE all, and a, yeah. a number and everything. So first of all, I believe it was 47, they shut down that department. It's now called something completely different. So it would not have been around in the 80s. 80, the early 80s. Um, the second thing was, if he worked for the contractor, as he said he worked as a contractor, is his pay stubs, which should, and like normal procedure about anywhere, right. government included, because I've had, let me just say, uh, this don't give me any expertise, but I've had security clearance in the government working at Microsoft. I get paid by Microsoft, not the government, right, because they're the contractor. So my check stubs still say Microsoft in my case, and it should say E, E, and G or whatever, if that's the, still the same one. I'm not sure if that was Los Alamos or both. That was one thing. It was Apparently it was discovered that the little, uh, I'm, I'm calling it an EIN number. That's not what it is. It's like an employee ID number. Right. That was taken from somebody else. 
Yeah, he they did. searched that, and it didn't come back as what he said it was. Right. Um, he reproduced a badge, his his actual ID badge that he would get in the door with, or his yeah. badge that came out of the hand scanner we'll talk about. Because he's a photo guy, so he made a pretty damn good-looking replica right. of a badge. And it uh, and it was had the same number and had Department of the Navy or Naval Intelligence or whatever, same, same stuff that didn't match up to what it – should have looked like or whatever, but then he then later said he reproduced that to show because people were asking about it. Um, just so many little things like that. And really quick, back to the Los Alamos thing. Uh, I think, uh, well, I'm not sure if I've completed that thought when I was talking about Los Alamos. That's what apparently attracted the attention of this EEG contractors. He worked there as a physicist, and he was the rocket guy, right, the rocket car guy. Who was in the paper. And that somehow landed him an interview with a government agent who recruits people to work on these kind of secret programs. Yeah. He so, said he was headhunted. He was headhunted. That's what he said. Right. Yeah. And um, there was some guy apparently that, you know, came forward and interviewed him and he got him in and whatever. And he signed all these papers and had all these debriefings. I think he said, and uh, he had over 300 and something debriefings that came in these blue folders. Uh, and, which is really odd because in, when you, you listen to some of these uh, interviews, it's, again, really vague, and he don't know anything. But then you got 300 and something different folders of information. And now, so it's, you know what I'm saying? It's kind of back and forth. And yeah. this is where he learned where they came from. This is what I was getting ready so, to interject. like You're you right. mentioned very early on, it wasn't the first day, but another day. Because he was very, I think he was there six months, I think. That's what we're guessing, claiming. yeah. Um, because he was only at the Los Alamos place six weeks as a contractor, apparently, before he got fired there or got con- uh, or recruited, whichever it is. Right. So, anyway, at some point he was walking by and saw nine hangar doors open, which are usually closed, and claimed that there are a total of nine craft there. And they're all different, by the way. Right. I'm not sure what kind of angle you can see in every single hangar door to see that they're all different, unless you're walking straight down the middle and have time to look at everything in detail side to side. But he claims he was just walking by and saw the hangar doors open, and there's nine different ones, and they all are different. And he called the one he worked on, because he only touched one, the sport model. Right. <laughs> which is which is odd. Yeah, and I will say this, too, that in, in the uh, documentary and on Joe Rogan, or I should say and or on Joe Rogan, because a lot of this stuff blends together after you do so much research. Right, and exactly. He he does admit that uh, when he says that he learned that these craft were from a binary star system, uh, Zeta Reticuli, that he does understand that the government, a top secret agency, would feed you weird things like that so that if you ever told that, they could say, oh, that was Bob Lazar because he was the debrief that we said Z- Zeta Reticuli right, or whatever. Right, They gave him specific information yeah. so they know where the, the leak came from. So they would know from. where the leak came from. So he does say that. So I'll give him uh, a little leeway there when he names these weird things uh, that maybe – because he, he mentioned that he had a security clearance. Um, it had a – I said it earlier. Uh, but anyway, it had a weird name that people make fun of the name he used and – He's saying, "Hey, that's what was on there." You know, I know it sounds weird, uh, but uh, you know that's what that's what was there. So he knows that some of the stuff he read uh, that was supposed to be information on the stuff he was working on could be, you know, baloney. But um, he called it like he said, and and that's that's another weird part. Something I just thought of just as I was saying that he has a great recall of every specific name and everything of the six months he worked there. But can't remember a professor or anything about no. the, that. That kind of pisses me off, actually. Because right. He does remember specific names and details and everything about yes. where he worked and when he worked. And, there. and it's interesting that he pawns off a lot of the information that you would ask in an interview, like Joe Rogan, for example, on this other guy who existed, right, that he worked with that you've never heard from. Yeah, he names him, but all uh, the time. Yeah. Like uh, Barry. Was Barry. it Barry? I think it is Barry. Barry. I think it is Barry. Yeah. Barry, you know, had been there a long time. Barry had seen this. Barry knew that. But the way he described it was uh, everything's so compartment, uh, co- like you mentioned earlier, it's, it's so it's separated so nobody communicates and only some higher up knows it all. 
which, I mean, I can believe that coming from the government, but that's not the scientific method. You know, I was saying to you, if we were assigned to some research thing based on, it doesn't matter what your research, any kind of scientific field, we would be assigned to that for years and share data. That was the, that's the whole point. You share data with other scientists. And, but again, that's a, that's a separate, that's a small little thing. There's no telling how the government actually researches things. They get information from one team, this team, and somebody else up here. Maybe they put it all together. I don't know. Makes no sense. It makes no sense to me that he studied the propulsion system, but was not allowed to study the craft but one time. And basically peek inside and see the basic layout and, and this little door and all that stuff. You know, I, the only thing I could say to that is that that's probably because he didn't work there long, that maybe if he had worked there longer like Barry did – yeah, he would have got to go in it more or something. We I need to talk know. to Barry, man. Yeah, and we that's do. what he says. It's either on Joe Rogan or on the, that, that documentary. He's like, you know, I've tried. I've tried to find him and all this stuff, you know, because he could tell you. He could tell you exactly what I'm saying is true. Yeah. Um, I want to say really quickly, too, going back to the UFO itself, the way he described it, we were talking about the three layers and those kind of the – that because he drew it out and he sketched it on this uh, documentary – What's the guy's name I told you? Billy Meyer. Billy Meyer. Okay, so Billy Meyer was a UFO guy. you got to remember with this story once you learn, because you think that like Bob Lazar was the first guy who ever did anything with UFOs the way they make you feel about it, um, because he discovered it. There were UFO guys around long before that, you know, seeing things in the desert and whatever. So this Billy guy uh, came out, and I don't know, I don't know anything about him personally, or I didn't go into his story, but... Basically, he came up and said he claimed to see flying saucers and stuff. And when you look at his pictures, it's very, very close to what Bob Lazar describes. And people think he basically borrowed his design because it's got the same little, what he called hatches at the very top. Yeah. The same little uh, node that sticks out. It's almost like an antenna at the very top. And then kind of the same shape and everything. And believe it or not, we couldn't believe this. Um, uh, testes, test, is it testes? Testers. Tester. Tester. Testes. <laughs> <laughs> testes came out. <laughs> you know, here we go. 40, 40 and slip. Uh, testers came out. Big model company. If you ever put together models as a kid, you know this company. They do all yeah. the glue and everything. That's right. It's on the label. They came out stuff. with the Area 51, I'm sorry, Area S4 UFO revealed model kit and put this thing together based off Bob Lazar's descriptions and drawings and sketches. Right. Which is basically, and, uh, from what people think, I'm not saying I necessarily believe it, I just think it's, it's a funny coincidence, essentially the design was stolen from the Billy guy. Right. Or, what's the other side of that? Oh, they, it's, that's they what they're all saw saying. The same they, they both saw they, the same you know, thing. Either, yeah, he saw this uh, previously, and that's what his mind came up with when it was time to draw this thing. Right. Or they saw they both saw the same real UFO. I will say this right before we came on to record this, I was looking and I saw that the uh, element one fifteen thing was right uh, written about in like May nineteen eighty nine. And what was the name of the? It wasn't Popular Mechanics, was it? It was there was uh, there was some Popular Mechanics stuff with him because a lot of the stuff that he, information he got, people were saying was available back in those days, like the rocket stuff. There was a but there was an article about this element, heavy metals being used as fuel, mm -hmm. and it just so happened like that was May of eighty nine. He comes out with this story in like August of eighty nine or something like that. Right. So they said, I wonder if he had a subscription to that uh, something engineer. Uh, magazine and they said whatever. he had because he had gotten information about the rocket stuff as a, as younger uh, and then up even up to uh because this is what goes back to him kind of being a, you know definitely interested in electrical stuff and tinkering uh and it seems to be that he got a lot of stuff from articles like how to build that rocket engine it, right. can, it was uh, in the in the damn 70s and 80s and before that you could get crazy shit for toys Oh yeah, there was uh, there was chemical um, I mean, chemistry sets that were probably dangerous. That's what he talked about. It was um, like the most dangerous toy ever. What I mentioned, he had you, that as a kid. yeah. What I mentioned to you about the the element one fifteen, the supposed solid fuel that uh, they've just now proven exists in two thousand three with Russian and American scientists, but there's no stable isotope that lasts over like sixty three milliseconds or something. Right. Um, 
he's saying that's what's powering these things back in the day in, in the 80s and UFOs and, 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 and it has to be manufactured in a very specific he don't know why but it, it's got to be cut a certain way from cylinders into triangles and, and they send it off to another place that uses a lathe and cuts it down in a certain way and he all these discs and so that's another recall he has that's very vivid right about that yes you know that is true um but yeah, so again, the part of me that wants to believe, I understand that we're dealing with alien, we think is advanced technology here that could be outside the realm of current modern understandings of dealing with these, you know, elements that we've just now discovered and put on the periodic table and stuff. So that's the part that I kind of lean towards his story being credible is that even if you got a hundred modern day top shelf physicists to say this is how this stuff works, don't forget we're dealing with stuff that's supposed to be way advanced, uh, uh, could be a thousand years ahead of where we're at right now in our time. It could be that far advanced. So maybe they're speaking on something that would be like having a caveman tell us about fire now, you know, right after they just discovered it. So I, I don't know. That's just kind of the way my mind works. You you can maybe take that and yeah. He, and he uses a, he that? uses a good analogy uh, to Joe Rogan at least. You know, think about taking a a little a mini nuclear reactor and dropping it back in the Victorian days. You know, they'd figure out that it does something and it makes power, but then as soon as they started taking it apart, it would kill them. Yeah, uh, or dropping yeah. a motorcycle back in the old West days. And, right. You know, I, I get that. But the other thing with 115, as I was telling you, I believe, outside was in those days, this article that I came across shows all these old chemistry kits and in books and textbooks in schools, they had the full periodic table, but they also had these the ones that were not discovered yet. They had places for them. Yeah. Just so they blank. were blank boxes with their with the numbers, you know. Yeah. And one fifteen, I was, you know, when they discovered that twenty oh three, they also discovered four more that nobody mentioned. So it's like he he could have learned it from what you said, which I think makes more sense now, you know, that he picked that up the same year that he came out with these details. Exactly. But it makes, he could have make sense. He could it does. Uh but he could have picked it up from those old school things back in high school or elementary school. And like you said. He saw that they were, you know, just designated squares just for exactly. in the future. They're going to put something there. That buys you a lot of time knowing how rare it is that a new element gets added right. to that exactly. chart. Right, exactly, and maybe never. So you he maybe he may, he probably never thought that he'd have to deal with that right. question is if, the point. If that's the case, then, yeah, he, he thought yeah. he would die before they would put one there, and he could say, you just don't know about it yet. Exactly, yeah. this stable version of it, which now we have it, but – we can synthesize it, but we can't. There's no stable isotope, so um, um, that's that's a big red flag. I want to say one thing too about he describes the way this thing flies. Yes, he says it will hover up like a normal flying saucer that you've seen your whole life, but then it will tilt ninety degrees up on its end, and the the little. Uh, I want to call them thrusters, uh, the the yeah. gravity things that come out. You would think would be behind it. They're in front of it, and they're distorting um, gravity in space time. Space time in front in of it. In front of, right. of it, yes. And and it draws to it. It draws the destination to it. Basically, it could go so fast. So that all sounds crazy, but then you find this gimbal video, which is. U.S. Naval pilots find, flying these fighter jets, they tracked, and there's film of it. You can go look at the gimbal videos on YouTube. It shows um, a thing that looks exactly like he described, or at least a silhouette of it, and it tilts like that, 90 degrees, and goes in that direction. So I don't know. I, I don't know. Of course, I, I, I want to believe this stuff, but that was released by the Pentagon, actually. Right. Um, so I, I do buy the video. And that's now 20-some years after he made his claim that everybody thought was weird that he described it that way. Right. And uh, one thing I want to say, too, about his personal life is he did get raided by the FBI and stuff. 
Uh, so that did happen even recently. So yeah. that is that is valid that there's people been after him. But what I was telling James was my thought process was if he signed this, as he said, he signed a quote unquote ten ten, um, you know, document basically non disclosure thing where they can put you in prison for 10 years and fine you $10,000 back at the time. That's a lot of money. Yes. And they never did any of that. The government didn't prosecute him because he probably didn't actually release classified information. That would be what you would guess. But he did go, but the FBI did raid him. So people were saying, well, why they did raid him? Well, when somebody claims this out loud and they know who you are, the FBI is certainly going to check on you. I would think they're certainly going to check on you and see if you're telling the truth or if you're lying, find out who you are and if you actually did what you claimed to see if you committed a crime. So it makes sense that they would go after him, raid him. But then the most, the most recent thing was supposedly cause he maybe took some of this stuff and still has been in hiding all these years somewhere in his basement. This, uh, un, this stable yeah. version of one fifteen apparently, um, which could be very dangerous very if that's dangerous. real. So, yeah, I can um, see them at least checking. Right, you know? and that's what uh, I was reading something that was kind of funny uh, just going through some of these articles was if they did this test flight out there, I mean, did they have, like, hazmat people sitting around? Is there a fire department nearby? Would it not destroy the entire city? I mean, nobody knows how distorting gravity. You're creating gravity. Right. I mean, how does that work and how powerful is that? So it's really odd, the physics behind it. And then you and we won't get into all the technical physical physics stuff, but there are some articles uh, you can find from that website where physicists go over his words and basically say, no, uh, there's no way that this is possible from what we know it is of, actually, of basic physics. It's good reading. It is. The way the guy writes it yeah. is really good. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it. It's a lot of reading, but it's it's really well written and, and it's broken down really good. Um, I, I do want to say that... Um, we were talking about before we started recording that, hey, this is a big deal. This is a big, big topic to open up here on this podcast. And we know that there's going to be some of you guys that have a lot to say on this topic. Oh, yeah. So in the comments, you know, if, if we get a lot of comments with a lot of arguments one way or the other there could be a part two of this so just don't you know, oh no don't doubt beat us up because and this we're is, still going down the rabbit hole yeah, ourselves this is the tip of the iceberg i just want to say uh, also um one last thing on the kind of uh you know what debunks the idea of debunking his story at least is that there's been so many people who've got you know we you we were talking about the, the i guess you were mentioning the government trying to erase his thing, trying to make him look crazy. It was certainly a possibility, but it's like you, they erase the, the education part, but they don't erase the – oh, they also took his birth certificate, apparently. That was right. the thing he mentioned right. in the documentary. He did. So he never existed, but yet he still has bankruptcy files, you know, online, or you can find people. I mean, I'm looking here at letters where people sent letters to all these different agencies – trying to find his thesis, for example, never could, trying to find um, all these claims about, you know, specific details about his employment and education. And, I mean, they're out here. You can see the the actual printed letters where people have sent um, to these various people and agencies trying to find out information, uh, which comes back with nothing, uh, as usual. But uh, I just want to say that this this is not about. I mean, I still think that Groom Lake and Area Fifty One. I've I've been there myself, or close to it, obviously. There's definitely secret stuff going on that should be. I mean, it's military weapon type stuff. We know advanced planes have come out of there. So this is not to say there's not UFOs and whatever. That's not really what this is about. It's about his particular story. You had a lot of uh, UFO guys he hung around with that I think wanted to get their stuff out there that they had previously learned. And my opinion just right now is more leaning towards that he was more of a patsy and kind of bought into this, created this story, didn't really expect it to blow up like it did. He was interested in tinkering and electronics and all that stuff, but he pretended to be a physicist to gain attention, but then didn't really like the attention necessarily, or maybe he did, I'm not really sure. Um, but I don't, I don't, I'm leaning towards not buying his particular story as it's told with and just based off 
basically everything he's claimed has there's just really no proof of it. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of proof against it. But it's not to say that it's not about Area 51 or any other secret installation not being real. Because there have been a lot of other people come out that say they've worked at Area 51. There's, you, you've seen the ancient alien stuff. The you know um, We've uh, dissected alien documentaries. I mean, there's all that kind of stuff. But those people are not getting airplay like this guy. Because I guess he's just the biggest story because supposedly he broke the story. He broke the story. Yep. And he um, deserves his credit for that. He does. So the question he, is, did was he used by these other UFO guys who have been doing a lot longer to, to, to break the story for them? And then now you got all these pro UFO people trying to debunk him because they're making them he's making them look crazy. Right. You know, I think well, that's I think that's a legitimate concern amongst that group that's you know, conspiracy theorists who want to put it out there and get the information out there. But then when they, when he goes on the air and looks silly, essentially in his interviews and stuff, very vague stuff, whatever. And then some of the stuff's detailed later and they find out it's all bullshit about his employment and his education. That makes the whole community look in, insane, I guess. Well, there's a lot of people like who, you know, have seen something and they, you know, know it in their bones that they've seen this thing, right? And then all of a sudden there's this guy who who comes out and says, I've worked on something. It looks like this. And that looks like what these other people have seen. You know, they're dying for validation because oh, all yeah. these people have told them they're crazy. They didn't yes. see that. Because back, like, especially in the 70s and 80s, you know, it was more of a taboo thing or yeah. something, like Bigfoot or and something. And he's had people show up on his doorstep and say, you know, please talk to me about this, you know, because people think I'm crazy. And so there's the side of me that says, okay, he he wants his privacy, and he doesn't really like talking about this because every time he does, it, it, there's a new wave of popularity kind of that he is fallout. Like some part of me wants to think he's he likes the popularity, and in some part I think he might not. But – my thing is this it's like he's a quirky dude he really is he and and if you've ever had quirky friends or quirky relatives or something like that you can only imagine them getting pressed really hard no. and how how they would react you know it's not easy to be under the microscope whether you're telling the 100% truth, 80% truth, you know, because you want to embellish. Everybody wants to be smarter than they are and claim the stuff. Bigger that they tale. Yeah. <laughs> the bigger fish tale. Yeah. The bigger fish story. So I think what happened is in the beginning, he embellished a few things about his education to make him sound <laughs> more credible. And what it did is it had a reverse effect. When people realized that's a little full of shit, it, his story then holds less weight. Me personally, I believe, and I told Chris this, I believe he worked there. I believe he might have been a janitor. He might have been an apprentice or something. But I do believe he worked there, and I believe that, you know, he doesn't understand what he saw, but he saw something. And it could be top secret U.S., because that one had a sticker on it, had an American flag. It could be something they're working on, and in his fan fantasy mind that he leans towards, he thought it was an alien spaceship. I believe he saw something. I believe he's touched something. I uh, don't believe he know necessarily whether he worked on it and understands how it works that well, but I believe there's something there that's being hidden. And I yeah, that, that was actually it. a big point was that he worked there for, uh, I, we're, we're, uh, we're guessing six months, we're not really sure. It wasn't long before all this happened, apparently. But they made no progress at all, is what he says. They, don't, they still don't understand how it works, but yet somebody's flying the damn thing in a... In a yeah, and that then, takes and balls. Then, and then Wednesdays, remember, the Wednesday thing, that was the high-intensity flights. So they would he would take those other two UFO guys who were UFO guys before him, apparently, by what we've watched, and go see these things, and then he got busted the third time. That's when... I guess he came out. I'm assuming. Let me ask you this. All right, let's. Do you, 
Let's say that this is real, right? Let, let's say you, you buy it 100% or you know it 100% that, that there's a, a, an alien spacecraft that by not, there's no buttons, but by doing something, you can make it fly. Yes. Telepathy. Who has the balls to fly the fucking thing? I, know. I don't know. That would be like. I mean, how do you figure it out? That would be like getting in a car for the first time and somebody saying, if you turn that key or push that button, it'll start up. Then you're on your own. But that, well, that even makes more sense or, or well, to, to, to people because there's at least something there. He's saying there's nothing there. That's what I'm saying. You're yeah. sitting down and what are you doing? Just like guessing? Yeah, you put you're that just, isotope in there. And, I mean, that element 115 in there and it powers on. And it, right. And when does it shut off? Who knows? I mean, how do you, how does it burn up? I don't or, know. <laughs> and see, that's the thing because he's not saying all that stuff it makes right. sense to me because he's not saying I was the pilot or anything like that. He's saying, I saw it, and I didn't see any switches or anything like that, but maybe the pilots know more than him, you know? And yeah. I mean, they, 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 they know where to put your feet or whatever. And it's it's almost like, and I think that's a valid theory, too, that, like I said, he could have, if he did, in fact, get there with no education and no not being a physicist, was he there as a patsy to put out misinformation? That's certainly possible, too. Yeah, he could have failed all kind of entrance uh, things and they're like he's yeah, the perfect for this. That's what I was saying this with guy the whole perfect for the thing you were looking exactly, for. Exactly <laughs> the Los Alamos thing. If he's just a electrical electrical guy there who's building these small little things and certainly no physicist or no education to be a physicist, it, you, how do you get an interview number one or how do you pass an interview if you got one right. to get into a secret base? When it's usually top physicists from around the world or shit coming in these type of places, I'm assuming. Yeah. I mean, um, I got to mention really quick before we we done though. I, I, did I mention Jerry Freeman? I don't know if I did. Um, oh, you didn't mention him, but he's on the list. Okay, so Jerry Freeman was a guy who was a he he was studying the the gold rush, the forty nine er gold rush to California. So uh, this was one of the latest things I, I was watching before we started this uh, earlier today and, and last night. So this guy back in those days in the same time period was hiking through these areas to study, follow the path of the 49ers back in the old days. He apparently makes it through this entire area by hiking at night, avoiding security people and whatever. But now there are pictures you can see in this couple of videos I've watched where he took these selfies essentially with his camera and made it all the way through the place. He walked through that old, what which like Ponte Papoose Papoose Lake Papoose Lake. This is where Bob claims that uh, S four was in the side of that mountain. Right. Uh, was it? It was south of Area Fifty One. Papoose believe. Lake is like a dry lake bed. Another dry lake bed, just like Groom Lake. Yeah. And all these nuclear tests have been done out there for sent you know for decades. Right. Right. So he's taking a picture there, and there's a clear picture of him in front of this lake bed, this dry lake bed, and the mountains behind him, and there's nothing there. And he never got approached by security anywhere. And they're basically saying if he got anywhere close to this S4 place, he would have been at least approached, if not killed. Right. And he made it all the way through. And the guy died two years later, by the way, from radiation poison. I actually forgot to tell you this, too. Um, at Area 51, it uh, evidently is known that they have underground yes. sensors. Yes. So, yeah, they do. like, yeah. Even if there was no fence, they don't have to be a fence there. Yeah, no. they would know that he somebody's there, and at least rode out there. And I mean, the government definitely did a land grab when the stuff started happening. They did a land grab when yeah. people were starting to go there, and they you know trying to expand their boundaries or whatever. And there are fences in those places, and signs. Obviously, you've seen the the famous signs, uh, "Deadly Force Authorized" that type of thing. But not this guy. He went straight through the whole damn thing. Went right by supposedly where this S four location was. And there's nothing there in the side of the mountain, and which is where he claimed he worked. So there's even questions about the actual facility, right? Where he was. But uh, then again, it, now honestly, um, if the, if this was court, you know what I mean? I mean, uh, you could have a lawyer that would say, "Is Freeman? Is he really there at Papoose Lake?" 
Oh, what's sure. his backstory? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But he lied to just make Lazar look bad. You know what I mean? Abs- so, absolutely. All we're saying is this was the information given to us that we exactly. stumbled upon. We don't know Jerry Freeman. We don't know no. his credibility. And he was the the thing but, about him is he wasn't a UFO guy. He right. Was studying he was, something completely different. Yeah. Uh, and it and, was confirmed he did die two years later from, from basically exposure. radiation yeah. poisoning uh, sickness. So uh, it was still very radioactive there from all the tests. So it's you know that's proof enough. Yeah, the, the, I mean, because yeah, they can we, check your liver and stuff. That stuff metabolizes. Yeah, you know, right. They can find all that. Right. Different. So yeah. So there's no question that Groom Lake and Area 51 is a restricted area with secret stuff and military, you know, weaponry and whatever. I think the, I think people think the S91 Blackbird came from there a long time ago and some other stealth fighters and stuff like that. But no doubt about that stuff. But just a lot of doubt on his particular story and how he ended up there and the education, the background and. The weird things, um, you know, just just don't add Photographic up. Photographic memory, one moment, and yeah, and very know, vague the next. I can't yeah. remember dates. So I can't. I'm bad with years and now. But he right. knows some people, but he don't know perfect. There's just so many things. So oh, and one thing we will say is, because uh, you touched on it, you're saying yeah, no doubt he's a tinkerer. No doubt he is smart enough to put a rocket in a car. Oh, yeah. That, I yeah, mean, he yeah. is a really smart guy. Uh, for He's not your average Joe as far as that goes. And he does actually work with heavy metals and stuff uh, at his job. He ships them. He's gotten in trouble for shipping some. Illegal ones yeah, across state lines. That he shouldn't that have. Was, that was exactly. The dude makes fireworks. I yeah, mean, he, he, he runs a small little lab, like essentially. Like a shade tree chemist in he, a way. He is. You know, he, he is. He wears a lab coat and shit. And, right. You know, takes it seriously. He knows some stuff. Uh, what does he know? He's refused repeated you know, request to sit in front of physicists and talk about the stuff. Yes, he will that not talk to physicists. That does bother me, yes. yeah. Um, but no doubt he's a smart guy, you know. Yeah, and, and that's kind of what I said when we walked out there after the thing. I was like, that's a weird job for him to be just having some little mini lab where he ships out things and makes fireworks for a physicist. Yeah. because And, and sure, you mentioned like, well, if he's – the government shutting him down to make him look crazy. Maybe he can't get a job somewhere. Yeah, I have thought that a but lot. But at the same time, when you look back at during the time this all happened, he did have the photo business, and he filed bankruptcy for it, and he was in California, and the, the physical locations that you can find of known addresses and stuff never had him in Massachusetts. And so there's just too many things. And so while I agree everything, like you mentioned the House of Cards thing, just because one thing's not true doesn't make some other things. There are some things that do crumble without the education, without the yeah, background. For agreed. sure. And I also want to say what I told you too is that this would not be the first thirty year hoax that let me down. The Bigfoot no, that's thing right. that's let right. me down that's right. bad. Yeah, you know, Bigfoot the Patterson film. Yep. That it film was so conclusive. Yeah. And for so many years people, you know, would argue up and down about whether it was real or whether it was somebody in a suit, and all of a sudden on a deathbed, you find out. Yep. And then you see videos of the guy walking, and, and you can realize see it's, it's, that's him. That's that dude. That's him. Same exact gait and hands. Yeah, so really. This wouldn't be the first thing to let me down, but I just I don't, and I and I guess I shouldn't be saying this uh, on YouTube, but I don't trust our damn government. I just don't. So I buy into the fact that they would shut a whistleblower up. But I think they let him hang himself a little bit. Uh, yeah, if that's do. the case. And that's what I was saying earlier. In this day and age, um, in the digital age, yeah, you can erase somebody now, basically. But in those days, there's just too many. Everything was on paper in a filing cabinet somewhere. You, you started having computers, but it wasn't to that extent at all. And I don't think they can – they would randomly pick some things and not others. And certainly you would be able to find his thesis and all this other stuff and, and, and verify things on, on documentation, but nobody has any records. And can the government do all that? And, and I don't trust him either for the most part. I mean, I want him to stay the hell out of my way is pretty much my feeling, but they're made up of flawed people. When we, we, we always use the word they, yeah. they, they're after us or they're watching us. It's like, yeah, that, I'm sure, but they're still people. The government is made up of people who are probably you know idiots themselves? So I don't, I don't, I don't buy that they can completely do all this stuff and, and not just prosecute the guy for breaking the true. law. It makes I know you, you know for breaking the law because 
it makes it makes more sense to me now looking into all this. And we, I'm going to keep going because there's probably other stuff to, to to consider. But you know, it's like there's a reason the FBI comes after him. It doesn't have to be related to they they check him out. Like you mentioned, across state lines, he's got chemicals yeah. that could be used in today with terrorist attacks and Absolutely. sold to the wrong person. Absolutely, there are reasons he can be checked out. He's gotten into trouble several times for 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 that for the brothel thing. Yeah. And all that. So I'm not saying that just because of past trouble that he's a liar. It's just that I don't, I'm again, I'm more leaning towards now that his particular story is not entirely f- true. Um, whether it's all on him or he got together with these other UFO guys or he was kind of a patsy in this yeah. whole game and kind of bought into it for a little while and then he's kind of back and forth on the whole fame thing. It's just really odd. But, uh, well, I do want to just interject the one last thought here, and it's something that I just uh, discovered last night, and I sent you the text about it. Um, there's a guy named Gary McKinnon who got in. He's, he's from England, um, over there somewhere. I'm pretty sure it's England. But he uh, – <laughs> Europe. <laughs> <What's this? laughs> he got in trouble in like uh, 2001, 2002 for hacking, you know, Pentagon computers – and U.S. Yes. government computers, and because he was looking for proof that they were covering up UFO stuff, and he says that he uh, on a 56k modem, he downloaded a picture. 56k modem. Yes, Good God, <laughs> he, I remember those days. I got like, a 56k. Yeah. It's 2400 BPS. <laughs> so he, he's watching this picture download, and he sees a flying saucer. That looks a lot like the one that um, Bob Lazar talks about. And before the picture, because it's like watching a picture get painted when you were downloading a picture on 56K. Uh, before <laughs> right. it totally finished, he saw, he said, somebody took over the mouse and uh, logged him out and before he could hit print screen and get a picture. But anyway, he said um, that he did uncover an Excel document that had a lot of different um, things about UFOs on it. And he did um, see where they were working on aliens, reverse engineering, alien spacecraft that uh, were dealing with anti-gravity stuff. The The reason I buy into this is because the U.S. has tried to extradite him since then. And it was a big thing. It went before their parliament and everything. Where right. they, they had to say no. Even though we have an agreement with the U.S. about extraditing, this guy has Asperger's. He, he, he will kill himself if he goes over there. You're not extraditing him. So the, the U.S. government is wanting to punish this guy for doing that. And he deserves it. I mean, he shouldn't do that. I know that's a crime. But I don't know. I, it makes you wonder if they're trying to get him over here to keep him from talking about the yeah. stuff, you know? I don't yeah. know. And that's, that was what I was going to say is to, to add to that is that shows you though, like Julian Assange more recently with WikiLeaks. Yeah. When people leak shit, they go after people. That's right. And they are leaving this dude alone. They did not prosecute him in any way, shape or form. One last thought on the money thing. People will say, what's the, what's the motive? If he's lying, what's the motive? Uh, and he says, of course, I'm not getting paid for any of this. Yep. Um, there's no, I don't like attention and all that stuff, but there were some tapes for sale. I don't know exactly how he got money from her. If he did. Yeah. That needs there was more some, exploring. Yeah, yeah. There was some, there were some tapes for sale called the Lazar tapes. And it was again, with these other two UFO guys, um, Lear was one of them. I think the Lear's, there was another guy too involved. Some of the guys that went out with him on the Wednesday night flights. Yeah. Um, so there was money being involved. And as you mentioned, it was a great point when I said, damn, they even made a model of this thing. His name's on that model. That's right. There's um, no way he's not getting money from there's that. There's no way that he's not ele- he's using his Whether name. Whether it's a one-time payment, uh, who cares? Uh, there's no way he's going to let testers put right. a model out with his name on it. So, And there's more to, to research on the money thing, but the bottom line is there's money involved, and they just don't tell you that. So, you know, documentaries like But he is about filing him. bankruptcy. So, you know, he did yeah. file bankruptcy, so he maybe did. he don't have much money. He did. Well, I don't, I don't know when the time that was. Yeah, but yeah that was during the – good. Who, that, knows? Exactly, <laughs> Who knows? That was during the, the the film days when he was a film processor, supposed to be at MIT at the same time. But, yeah, so there's there's something to there, – I don't know, again, how he if he got paid, if there, 
if he's receiving something now, if he's if he does like the attention or doesn't like it or claims to not like it but really does. A lot of people do that. Uh, that's true. Uh, so there's just it's just really odd. So there's something to it, um, and it, it doesn't necessarily have to be money to be motivated to do to, nope. to lie. It's a fun rabbit hole. It, it is. I agree. You know, I don't care if the next stone I uncover proves a hundred percent that he's lying. It's fun. It is. It, it, it's it fun. It keeps your brain going, and hey, yeah. when you start reading about physics, you know, it, oh, it and makes you, you. You know, I am with physics. I'll get on this physics train yeah, all the time and go down, you know. That's good for your brain. <laughs> that's just the kind of shit I do um, when I'm bored. I'll, I'll just go down these. I was, you know, when James, right before he moved out, a couple of weeks, I guess, or I don't know, maybe in months now, I don't I don't keep track of time. I don't have a, <laughs> a damn grab, a graviton device. Come on, but, Bob Lazar, tell me exactly. I, I, but uh, no, but you know, I got into the whole you know quantum physics thing, and I was yeah, I, it we was racking my brain really back on videos. the slit experiment, the double slit experiment, and grab you know waves versus particles, and again, we photons get into, and gravitons, exactly, and gravitons came yeah. up in this thing. It's like it's just a it's not is it real? Is it not? I mean, is it a wave or a particle? I mean, all this kind of stuff. He it's calls them stuff. he calls it gravity waves. Yeah, he does. So he specifically says it's a wave. It's like and and all these. Physicists now are saying, no, we know that every and, subatomic particle we discover both acts as, acts as both. But he's not saying he made that up. He's saying that's what they told him. Yes, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Which, yeah. But it goes against what, obviously, what any physicist that working there would say today, at least. Right. You would think. Yes. Unless so, it's alien technology that nobody understands. Right. And uh, it's, it, it seems impossible. Except it's basically, for the pilot. Exa- apparently. Somebody's flying the damn thing around if he's going there watching it on Wednesday nights. <laughs> you know what I mean? And and flying it fast and doing crazy shit, you know, which would kill somebody inside. But of course, he says with the gravitational field around it, right? It would not affect, it could, you never know. There's, there's no inertia. We've stuff, never right? seen a vehicle like that. Exactly. But anyway, I, that's I would the, say that it, when the cars first started, nobody would believe that we could go 200 miles an hour in a car and not die. You know what I mean? No. Yeah. Sure. You know. Yeah. And now you know we've learned a oh, lot. Oh, sure. I mean, yeah. I mean, look at just just look at the, the G forces put on. People in you know F twenty two Raptors God. or something or F sixteens, uh, it's amazing. They have to go through super hard hardcore training for that. And it's like you said, who the fuck gets in a damn alien ship and sits on the floor because you can't fit in the seat? No steering wheel, there's and nothing. there's nothing to touch or right. control. And you just start thinking, what do you do? I mean, how do you even get there? I don't know. That is, and learn how to control it. That's tough. So it, it's but really. I wish Bob would have worked in that department. I know. <laughs> Somebody, <laughs> I wish we'd meet the man who did. Because there there's were these Barry, other, damn it. There's uh, exactly Barry knows everything, and there's a lot of other departments that know something if this happens. That's right. But uh, that's the gist of it. I think we've got the majority of the, you know. I think we'll we be t- doing a part two. I I feel it. I, I think so too. too but there's it's, there's, to there's so much at. to do. I mean, we didn't go. Re- we didn't get into too much detail. We kind of touched on. Most of the stuff a little bit, but there's just so much digging. Would you recommend the documentary? Oh, yeah, de- absolutely. Me too. Yeah, definitely. 100%. It doesn't matter if you believe it. It's not right. about, it's, this is not about, it's not your typical, are UFOs real? Oh, God. This is the we story forgot. of a guy who claims UFOs are real. It's different. We forgot our main critique about that documentary. We said it was the pool house, yeah, but it was right. not. <laughs> What's our main critique? Of the documentary? Yeah. Oh, Mickey Roar. Yes. Oh my God! <laughs> Why is Mickey Rourke, dude? You needed <laughs> subtitles. We could not understand anything he said. <laughs> it was it was horrible, guys. I like Mickey Rourke, but my I know. God, he don't need to be. But he, they tried to over, and that's why the night before, Ho walked out the door ten minutes or fifteen minutes in, said they didn't even got to the fucking point yet. <laughs> Nobody said a word. You can't understand what Mickey Rourke's saying. They tried to like over. Uh, dramatize they did. And, and it's like Way just bad. get to the conversations that's all they needed to do but yeah i mean i don't i don't think i got a single word he said occasionally the, yeah one. we would throw one out every now and again but and laugh about it was it. like pointless to have mickey rourke do this documentary oh my gosh <laughs> so, his lips are too tight or yeah, something that, it's all the surgery. botox yeah. and, and plastic surgery dude i can't that, that's crazy to me it is um, anyway, so yeah, let us know what you think, you know, man. Wherever you listen to this, uh, I, I, quick uh, as usual. If you're listening to this on YouTube, this is also available on every major platform. I won't go through all those; you know what they are. Um, but you know, you can listen to this podcast anywhere. And if you do listen on those platforms, give us a, a rating if, if you don't mind. We'd appreciate it. 
And stop by YouTube and subscribe there and give us your comments. That's where we read the comments. And let us know what you think about this documentary and the story, if you know about it or if you're going to dive into it or any other information. And we'll follow up with a, probably a part Heck two yeah. if there's more. And as we mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, don't forget to drop us some just questions about anything. Ask us anything questions. Yes, we wanted to do open. one of those podcasts. Yeah. But we uh, we mentioned that kind of the end of it last time, so we didn't get enough. But we did get the first question that led us into this anyway. Yeah, so ask us anything, guys. Uh, anything drop some at, questions a, Anything at all. Within reason. You know, yeah. We'll answer within reason. But That's right. We'll try to be completely. Not telling you where I have my bodies. <laughs> not telling you <laughs> right, that. Right. No, no shit like that, mm-hmm. obviously. But, uh, yeah, yeah, let us know what you think. Uh, this is a crazy-ass story, and uh, there's a lot more digging to do. And uh, probably going to start doing that after I eat something because I'm about to faint. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> Me too. Anyway, we'll just let this fade out, and uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs>